Hello and welcome to a new episode of The Lowdown. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by co-author of the award-winning Gold Dust book, David Meyer. David, welcome to the show. Connor, thank you for having me on. Looking forward to speaking. David, of course, you know, being based now in the US, but with a Northern final like that, I suspect um, you <laughs> began your coaching journey in fair flown fields. Um, tell us, where did your career begin? Yeah, it was, so I'm, I'm an, originally from Wigan and um, grew up in a, in a falling family. My, my mum and dad both played. So my mum actually played for England. My dad played professionally too. And then my dad went on his coaching journey, on his coaching path. And when I came along, it was obviously, I, think, I don't think I had much choice of playing or not, given the, the background of the family. I was, as soon as I was walking, I was kicking a ball around. And at the time, my dad was coaching. And throughout my childhood, even up to now, he was coaching at, at academies. And I was playing within the academy system in England, but I would spend a lot of time with my dad. Um, by choice, he would be going to games or to training, etc. And I would want to go with him. And... I didn't really know at the time. Obviously, when you're younger, you don't have a, a full idea of what you wanted to do. I wanted to be a footballer. That was about it. But I think over time, you pick up traits and habits from the people that you spend the most time around. And with me watching him coach so much, I would say I got pretty fortunate in picking up some of the traits and the habits and the way that my dad dealt with people just, just from watching, honestly. And um, I played, I actually retired at 25. I had a, a hip surgery. I had, had multiple surgeries up until that point and just couldn't deal with full-time football. So I retired. Um, and from there, I was already coaching at that point. I already had my UA for B. And when I say I was coaching, it was just voluntary, voluntarily really in the UK. I'd Prior to that, I had been coaching in the US. I was at a college that I'd coached out a little bit um, and just at clubs. But back home when I was there, I was just volunteering, just putting in some hours and, and enjoyed it. And after that, uh, after I'd had my hip surgery and I was good to go and start coaching again, I ended up at Manchester City with their International Academy, um, just part-time. And really it was a not a stopgap, it, but it was something that I needed to do, especially after coming out of play and I needed to somewhat find my identity again and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I got offered an, an opportunity to move back over to America and I've been here now for just over three years. I'm in Salt Lake City, so I'm now a, a director at a club in Salt Lake City, Utah, and enjoying it and learning every day. And I mean, one thing you mentioned there, which I'm keen to pick up upon, David, of course, is the identity part, you know, having to retire from the game at a relatively young age, of course, at 25, then looking to find your purpose again as a coach. I mean, when people mention David Meyer and Keith Meyer, we automatically think of gold dust. But for you and your dad, Keith, what does gold dust actually mean? Oh, great question. Uh, just where you're sprinkling particles of knowledge to help people really uh, we use that saying that's it, it's been a saying that my dad's used for years and years and it's it's heavily used in the podcast but it's just about those little particles of knowledge that you can sprinkle on people's lives it, it doesn't have to be massive sometimes it may be massive and, it, and it's a plays a big impact for somebody. But even if it's something small, I think with the book, with the podcast, if there's one thing that someone takes out of it and it helps in any sort of way, then that's a bit of gold as for us. Um, and it, it is interesting because, like I said, that saying itself has been used for years, absolute years. And in the writing of the book, we're going, what should we call a book? What should we? And I, I, I looked, I said, gold dust it has to be. That's the saying that's been used, and it's it was so fitting, obviously, given 
uh, what it was about and then and then the podcast was the same so yeah it's it, sprinkling particles of knowledge on people's lives you, you just you want to help people that's really what it's about and i suppose to delve a little bit deeper into it david if you don't mind i mean having observed your father from for years he's you stated at the beginning of this podcast and from your own playing and coaching experience i mean if there was a formula or if there were key ingredients that all mixed together to create this gold dust perhaps what would they be to create someone that would to create a, a person that could provide it curiosity most definitely curiosity um high standards so holding both yourself and others to high standards. Uh, empathy, I think, is one. Uh, um, a willingness to, a willingness and a want to listen and learn. Um, I, I think that element of wanting to continue to push yourself and to learn uh, and listen to other people is extremely important. Um, and I think... Look, communication skills are always, regardless of whether you're coaching, whether you're in business, whether you're working at a grocery store, a grocery store, a shopping, a shop, whatever it may be, communication skills will set you apart. So the words that you use, how you say things, the way that you project it, how your how you look when you say I could be saying something to you but my body gives you a completely different impression so i would say those there are obviously more but i'd say those are, are some really important ones and i think probably the main one is knowing who you are knowing what you stand for because if you don't know who you are and you don't know what you stand for i think it's difficult to then to to truly help other people it's not to say you can't help them but i think you have to know who you are and what you stand for what do you value what do you believe in what is your purpose and once you've got an idea of who you are and what's important to you i think you can then start guiding other people and sprinkling that gold dust on them it's a fantastic answer david and you know what i'm particularly intrigued about too was obviously with the book I mean, it's a book that advocates those soft skills, which are so integral to the air of coaching, really. But it wasn't too long ago that, I mean, all these soft skills were, you know, they weren't as glamorous, or they're not as glamorized as they are today. They were very much unsexy, and they weren't like what we all kind of dream up. You know, if you want to reach the pinnacle of coaching, we don't want to spend our time on these soft skills, so to speak. But, I mean, with that being said, at the time, what encouraged, I mean, both yourself and your father, Keith, you know, to pen a book and then subsequently begin a podcast, which is, you know, a very selfless endeavor from the both of you guys? I, uh, yeah, it was, for us, it was just, that is what's important. So the X's and O's are great. And don't get me wrong. You have to have you have to have an understanding of the X's and O's. You have to again, it depends on the level you're working at. If you're in first team football, the tactical element may be really important. And you still have to have that that technical element is very important. Even at the younger ages, you have to have the understanding of detail. You have detail, I think, is not less important, but probably less understood now than maybe what it, it was years ago where you have the likes of Dick Bay. The detail was absolutely incredible. And I think you have, that has to be maintained. But on top of that, you could know everything, everything in the world. You could have all the tactical knowledge, all the technical knowledge, you know, everything about the game. But if you don't know how to handle and deal with and help people, the rest of it doesn't matter. If you fail to connect with them and you fail to build a rapport and a relationship, then the reality is it doesn't matter what you know. It has no bearing on the, 
the relationship that you're forming. So most, most athletes want to know three things. Do you care for me? Can I trust you? And can you help me? And look, the help comes from, can you take me from A to B? Have you got knowledge that you that I can get from you? Can you make me a better player? But the other two things are the softer skills. They're nothing to do with X's and O's, really. Do you care for me? Boils down to showing an interest. It shows down to being, it comes down to being genuine with people. It comes down to asking questions about things that may have nothing to do with the sport. It, what's your, how's your dog doing? I heard you've got a dog. How is he? Oh, he's very good. Brilliant. Checking in, finding out about school, finding out about girlfriends, boyfriends, uh, how's home life, how's your kids? And taking time that shows that element of care. And then the trust, look, trust does not make no bones about it. You can't get trust in a, in a day or two days. Uh, trust takes time, but it comes with consistency in your actions and your words over a period of time. And it can take a long time to build it and a short time to basically blow it up. And I have had, ex I had experiences personally, Connor, where as, as a player, I didn't trust the coach that I was working for. It's not that he didn't know what he was doing because I, I would say that I've had coaches that didn't know what they were doing. But I've also had coaches that knew what they were doing that I didn't trust. I wouldn't have gone, I wouldn't have gone to war with him no chance where if you tell me look go out today and express yourself enjoy yourself we weren't going to we won't be screaming and shouting at you if you give you if you give the ball away we just want to see your reaction and the first time you give the ball away they're up, up and down the sideline screaming and shouting straight away i'm going hang on a minute the consistency between what you've said and what you've done don't align and for me, that it means a lot. That meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to me. And I, I had experiences as a player and ways that I felt I had feelings that had come out from the way I was treated as a player that I would never want to give to my players. And it's not to say that I'm perfect and I do things right every single time because nobody does. But I set out with the intention that I would never want to make a player feel the way I felt at times as a player myself. So those three elements, the do you care, can I trust you, can you help me, are key for players. Two of them are soft skills. And without them, the learning or can you help me doesn't really matter. Of course, well said. And for me, it's nearly emotional intelligence 101. I was discussing with Jonathan O'Neill, another guy who was on this podcast recently, great friend of mine. Um, Johnny's researched EI extensively, and he's always on to me, you know, before seeking to understand others, you have to understand yourself, which of course is huge and leads into my next question. I mean, you're a guy who's dedicated your life, David, to helping others master themselves. But in terms of self-mastery, of course, at the time, I mean, what was that process like of actually writing a book and combining that with coaching? What were perhaps of, of the habits and routines you put into place? Yeah, I think first and foremost is I I set out to achieve it. And there were times when I had no idea where the book was going. I'd be sat in Starbucks and I'd think, I've wrote 10,000 words and this is a mess. It's an absolute mess. But the, the thing about it, Connor, was we'd set out to achieve something and there was no way that it wasn't happening. We didn't know what how good it was going to be or if it was going to be well received. We had no clue about that, but it was, a, it was a process. And I think writing a book, you could, you could say the similarities between writing a book and coaching. Because the process of it is the same. You don't know exactly where the end product is going to be. You don't know what it's going to look like until it's there. And 
look, it's still not there because the, I'll read it and there's parts of it where I'll go, it's okay, but I'd like to change it. Just like in coaching, you have a player, there's never a finished product. It's never perfect. But like I said, I'll sit there and I'd be writing and I go, no idea, not sure. But over a period of time, things start coming together. And just like when you're coaching a player, players will have ups and they'll have downs. It'll be like a roller coaster at times where they'll be flying like I was in Starbucks and go, man, this looks good. And then a few weeks later, they're not. And you sat there, maybe scratching your head going, oh, hang on a minute, what's the reasons behind it? And look, you have to have at that point an understanding of how to, how to help in certain situations. So it, it was the writing of the book was the best learning experience I've ever had by far better than any course it just incredible because the amount of hours I spent writing it and putting thoughts together and researching and speaking to ex exemplars in the field it would it would have been hard of me not to learn anything because I spent so much time on something that I was basically just digesting information and breaking it down and then having to put it together and piece it together. I mean, I, I've read the book probably a hundred times. That's probably not even, probably more than that. It's hard. It was very, very hard, but it was all, I, I loved, I absolutely loved it. Just being with my dad, I'll go in Starbucks. I did all of the writing and he would come in and I'd say, look, I've done this bit. What do you think? And he'd say, yep looks good or maybe we need to add this in and we just took it from the from there really and like I said it it's a process we didn't we had an idea what we wanted it to be we didn't know how it was going to look if you'd have asked us at the start what the name of the book was what the chapters were going to be exactly what the book was going to be about all of the little details inside we couldn't have told you I couldn't have told you a single thing. We just knew that we wanted to write this book based around the importance of connection. All the bits inside of it came as it went on. It's huge. And it takes me back to one of your earlier podcasts. And you may have seen a notification LinkedIn today. I actually went back and looked at a small clip from Eric Hollis. And he was speaking about people, you know, emailing, raining him the whole time, asking about should they do this climb or that marathon or whatnot and he's just like first of all tonight sign up for the marathon then show me a photo of the confirmation tomorrow then we'll talk mm -hmm. you know, it's that commitment to go all in and then figuring out a way and what's even more class is what you were speaking about david in the book you know a few years ago that at the time that was like what you thought was coaching or your own beliefs regarding certain soft skills or x y and z but the signpost is now you go and you don't necessarily agree with everything you've written. Surely that's a signal or it's a signpost for yourself that holy, like holy crap, I've learned in this area. That's a signal mm -hmm. for growth. But um, you know what I'm particularly intrigued, of course, having a podcast myself. I mean, who were the one or two guests uh, in particular I was supposed to challenge you on some of your deeply held beliefs? Oh, wow. Um, oh, that's a good one. Well, we're on next week is going to be the 50th episode. I'd say they've gave me a different way of thinking so or maybe re-emphasized maybe re-emphasized points that I'd maybe lost or haven't thought about as much recently um man I'm I'm that's a that's a really that's a great question that is tough that that's tough. There's we can come back to it later. <laughs> yeah, we might have to come back to that one. Um, because I'm you've got me right on the spot there. Let's come back to that one. To be honest, it's just 
it's a fantastic book and the podcast backs that up. Like there'd be episodes there such as with Michael Beale, you know, the two times he's been on, the one with Per Mertesack or Mary Collis, I've listened to multiple times now. And it's just, it's a kind of a brilliant pick and mix for everyone. Because one of my next questions further down was about kind of cross-pollination. And it's something me and you have spoken about before in our last Zoom call. And it's just, you know, you can pick and mix. You can take something from football. You can take something from different sports. You can take something from different fields and combine it all together. I mean, in your opinion, are we doing enough of that as coaches? I don't know. I, I would say probably not. I'd say it's got better over time from what I've seen. I think the crossover is massive, massive. Like the things that you can learn from other people, whether it's a different sport or just a completely different field altogether is it's endless. I've been, I've been very big on this from, from being pretty young, to be honest, because I've played football, always have, and always been in and around the sport. But equally, I'd probably spent just as much time in the business field, both per, both from a personal standpoint with my own businesses and also with people that have businesses or have experiences in that field. I've got, I've got mentors that one of them, he's never kicked a ball in his entire life, any shape ball. But yeah, I could speak to him and he'll give me advice or give me a different outlook on something that is absolutely ideal for the situation that I'm in. If I need advice about a session, I'm not going to ask him because he's not, he's not going to give it to me. If I need that, I know where to go. I'll be going to my dad or I'll be going to other people that, that I, I hold close that, that help me in, in those elements. But when you're dealing with people, which is what we are as a coach, you deal with people. You deal with them on a daily basis. There's crossover in every walk of life at that point, pretty much. So if you've got an athlete that is causing problems at the session, or they've got, they've got something going on, there might be a teacher that's had the same experience. You never know. You, you truly never know. We call it the hidden school where you never truly know where your next learning is going to come from. You never know at what point you could be sat at a bar and the guy next to you or the, the girl next to you teaches you something. You never know. And if you are closed off to learning things, you might miss great opportunities to get something new. Now, don't get me wrong. I've, I've said it myself. I love learning. I, I love it. Like the, the feeling that I get when I'm learning things is equal to anything. I just, it, it, I get excited about learning. I get excited about pushing myself and going on a new course or reading a book or speaking to somebody that gives a little insight. And I go, you know, I never thought of that. At the same time, I think there's a point where you need to also take what you've got and implement it. Because I think if you're always looking to learn and you're always looking to pick up new information, you might not be implementing what it is you've already got. So I've had, I've gone through periods and I'd say a lot of people may be the same. You go on a course and you read a few books and you do this, that and the other, but at that, at, there's a, there becomes a point where you have to then go and implement what you've learned and put your own stamp on it, put your own authentic and unique personality onto what you've learned. Cause it's at that point, it's now yours. It's huge though. And what I liken it to is, suppose, the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. I mean, you said earlier on, you have a business mentor who could give you the greatest advice ever in terms of treating a player or treating a staff member, but you necessarily wouldn't go to him for a session design. Mm -hmm. So you have all these resources, you have all these people available. It's just, I suppose, organize them, them in a way that provides the most effective outcome. 
And yeah, I sorry, I, I, there's a quote that I I like. I, I really like it. When you're when you're looking for advice, when you're speaking to a mentor, you're generally doing it because you want the solution to a problem. There's a quote, like I said, that I like. Listen to learn before attempting to help. So if you have the information at hand and you have experiences, you know how to solve or help in certain situations, crack on. But if you don't, and it's some, you got to listen to learn before attempting to help somebody. So I... I'm I'm very big on it. I'll speak to I'm very fortunate. I speak to my dad. Every, we speak every day, every single day, and most of the times it, it, it's about football. Or I had an experience a couple of weeks back. <laughs> I've had a few, uh, and just to paint the picture, where the advice that you get, you might not like it at the time, but I think truly reflecting on your experience and then what you've been given can help you. So what would it be? Three, about three years ago now, we, I had a, an under 13s team at the time. We went to a tournament and I'd been with a group for probably two to three months. We played some really good stuff. It was a, it was a lower level team when I took them. And we had an identity. So, yep, it's great playing out from the back and but played some really good stuff. We went to this tournament. We outplayed everybody. We, every opponent, we outplayed them. And we lost every game. So I got in the car and I was, obviously, there's an element of disappointment because you know, we'd love to play another game. I got in the car and I thought, I'm happy. We've played great and we've, I'm not going to change the way I'm doing things because that's the right way. I called my dad up and he said, how do you get out? I said, well, we lost the games, but I'm not changing because we played some good stuff. And he said, well, you ever thought about tournaments? Tournaments are there for winning. It's not to say, and it, it's not to say that you don't play out, but maybe you have to adjust and adapt to get what, to get a result. Because that's what tournaments are for, generally speaking. I said, nope, not changing. I'm set out, I'm I'm doing it this way, and that's the way. And he actually, it annoyed me. I've told him since I, it he annoyed me at the time. So I'm in the car, I'm thinking, I don't know, we're playing the right way, and you're telling me I need I'm not changing. And I we, I was genuinely I was annoyed in the car. I'm on the phone, I'm thinking he's and he's kind of going on and explaining, and I'm thinking, this is ridiculous. And a few days later, probably a week, two weeks go by, and I'm reflecting on what was being said. And I thought, you know what? I think you might have a point. It's not that you have to come away from what you believe in. It's just that in the situation, you might have to adjust and adapt. It's not just with a, it's not just in a game itself. It could be in dealing with a player. That one example may be if you let, I have high standards on time. So if it's five o'clock, I'm there at 4.30. And if my players aren't there at five, I'm on them. Well, yep, you, they're your beliefs and you have to stick by them. But if a player turns up at 5.05 and you are not going to change your ways and you're not willing to find out why they're late, then it's all well and good. What if the player, what if the car broke down on the way to training? And you've not, you're not willing to adjust or adapt in that one situation. So that was a good learning for me, really good learning where I, since then, I have adjusted and adapted. I've, I've done it this season where you want to, you want something to look a certain way, but it can't always look that way. So you have to learn and adjust and adapt. So I'm constantly, I'll be in conversations where I'm like that and I don't always agree with it. Even afterwards, I, when after, on reflection, I'm, I still might go, you know what, I don't, don't agree with that. But there are times where I don't agree in the moment and then I, I do reflect. I'm very big. I'm a very big reflector where I'll 
really, really analyze things. And over time, I'll go, you know what? Maybe, maybe there's a better way or there could be other ways that I could do this that could benefit. Of course, there, you know, there's affordances too for player development. You know, specifically speaking right now, where you are located in the US, maybe a completely different kind of, kind of culture towards development and winning as opposed to the UK. I mean, I'm curious, you've spent a large chunk of your life now in the US, but having grown up in the UK, of course. I mean, if from a footballing landscape, if there was one thing you could bring from the UK to the US and one thing you could take from the US to the UK, what would that be? One thing I would bring from the UK, <laughs> referees. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, I would say the system in the UK. So academy system would come over here. They, they do have an academy system here, but it's, it's so spread out. You've got 30 MLS clubs, I believe it is over a country this size. So the amount of players that can't be selected just because that's what there is. So if you could bring that over with the amount of clubs, I think that would definitely help. And also the pay to play system is a challenge over here. You don't face it as much at home because people aren't paying as much, but if I pay you $2,000, I'm now paying your wage and I'm a stakeholder in that. And parents think they have a divine right at times because they're paying to overstep the mark. And I'm straight with parents, really, really straight. I'm, I'm honest. I will speak to them. I, I get on with the parents, no doubt about it. But if, you, if I need to tell you, I'll tell you. But not everybody, not everybody will be like I am where, we'll, where I'll deal with parents. Some of them won't. And it causes a lot of problems for coaches because they might just be uncomfortable dealing in those situations. They see it as conflict. So that's what I would bring over. What would I take back to the UK? Oh, the weather? The weather's nice in the summer. Um, <laughs> no, I'd say... I would say players over here, generally speaking, communication skills over here with players, the social skills are pretty good. I think it's a, I think it's a cultural thing. Um, for anyone that's, that's been over to America, you'll come over and the vast majority of people are just happy and smiling and they'll, they'll converse with you. You'll go into a shop and they'll be asking you how you are and, how your day's been. You go to England, you go in a shop, that's not going to happen. They'll probably scowl at you because you're making them do a bit of work and then you'll scan your stuff and off you go. But I think because of that, kids, generally they have, they have good social skills across the board. So I'd say it is better in America than anywhere else I've been. That doesn't mean that there's none in England with social skills because I've, come across kids with fantastic social skills in England too. But that that one thing for me, I think I would probably, that would probably be the one thing I would take back. Very interesting. And I suppose while we're on the topic of people, I mean, as you spoke about earlier on, players, you know, they want three things. Trust, care, and support. And there was one quote you had in your LinkedIn. It was about two months ago, and we spoke about it in our last call, David. Um, I have it here in front of me, actually. It's, it's not what you know. It's what you show. It's not who you know. It's who knows you. Could you unpack that, please? Yeah. So the, 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 the second part of it, about it's who you know. So, well that's that's the what people say is who you know this came from a mentor of mine actually so i was in georgia over a year ago and i was in the car with him he's ex-player 
He now owns his own club, but he's very, very successful businessman. So he's done the, the whole thing, his scope of, of experiences and knowledge. And he actually played at the club that was owned by Ted Turner. Now, Ted Turner's a multi-billionaire. He owned a lot of the sports teams in Atlanta. And he went into a room and Ted was there. Ted Turner was there one day and he said, I overheard the conversation and I thought I'd be quite smart and jumped up and said, hey, it's who you know. So Ted looked at me, he said, son, he said, no, it's not. Said, it's not who you know, it's who knows you. And Mark, who I'm talking about, he came away and he, he said, I couldn't figure out what he meant. He said, and only over time did I start to realise the truth in that statement that you could know a lot of people. So you'll speak to a lot of people and, and they'll say, oh, I know such a body or I know that person. I know, I know this person. Well, the reality is you may know them, but when it comes to it, do they know you? Would they pick up the phone to call you if there was a job offer or, or, or a job opening? Would you be on the list? So... They may be on your list of people that you know, but are you on their list of people that they know? Because the reality is that is where it matters. It's not about who you know. It's about whether they know you or not. And I found that that stuck with me. I'll never forget it. And then the other bit, it's, it's not what you know. It's what you show. That was, it was just something that, that I'd, Similar to what the book is, you could know everything. You could know absolutely everything. Or you may think you know everything. But if you don't go out and show, it doesn't matter. So you, you could have, you know, there's a, and social media is excellent. There's no question about it. But you have people on Twitter that'll talk the talk. And they'll be fantastic. They'll put some brilliant stuff on Twitter. Could they show you it? They might have all the knowledge, which is fantastic, and all the sessions and all the ideas. But if they can't go out and deliver that, it doesn't matter what they put on Twitter. It only matters if that's what if that's the job and they're actually providing sessions for people. So, look, you got to know stuff. But more importantly, you have to be able to show what you know. And then we go back to the book. You just have to be, you have to care about people. You have to genuinely, you have to have a genuine care for the people in your environment. And you have to show that. So it was it, that, yeah, that quote or the, the, the two quotes for me, are, they're important. There's no doubt about that. I think ultimately, what I like to think is with certain podcast series is, and in fact, your book, David, you know, it's kind of like a guidebook as to what the future coach ought to be. It's nearly signposting what the future game is actually going to be like and the qualities and the dispositions the coaches must have to be successful in that. But, you know, as we come to close now at the end of this podcast, David, I mean, what the three characteristics ultimately would you use to describe yourself as a coach? Respectful. First one. So I respect myself. First and foremost, I'm very respectful of myself. I think if you don't, if you don't respect yourself, then how can you respect others? So I'm, I respect myself. I'm respectful to others that, then come into the environment that I'm in, or if I go into their environment, I'm respectful of it. And with, with respect, I think comes all the other parts of having standards. I think respect could be punctuality. Respect could be cleaning up after yourself, leaving areas better than when you first found them. Um, the way that you speak to people, how you make people feel can all come under respect. Um, honest. I, I, I'm an honest person. I think there's two types of honesty. There's, there's brutal honesty, which 
yes, it gets the message across, but it can hurt. And then there's the other type of honesty where you can still tell people, but you do it in a way that it doesn't hurt them. So I would like to think that, that when I'm honest, um, I do it in a way that I don't hurt people. Um, so I would say respect and honesty are the two. Um, curring, I would like to think I'm, a, I'm, I'm curring and that if people were to ask about me, that they would say that I, if parents were, were to be asked, that they would say that I care for the, the, the kids. And I care for the, the well-being and I want them to improve and I want to see them grow. Now with that, caring for me isn't just putting your heart, putting your arm around the shoulder, around their shoulder, should I say. Caring expands through if they're not doing what they need to do, that you push them. Because I think at times people may get away with stuff that Look, if I care for you and I want you, I want the best for you, I'm going to push you. And I'll push you to be the best version of yourself and I'll do it every day. And I would say curious, similar to my dad. I, I, I am a very curious person, not just in sports, in football, or just in everything. So if someone, if someone asks a question and I don't know the answer, I'll be straight on Google. It could be anything from, well, what's the capital of this country? And I'll be, I don't know, have a look. Because I just like knowing things. I'd be great at a quiz. So if you need someone for a quiz, just just give me a shout. But I would say, I would say curious, definitely. And uh, I would say I'm a good communicator as well. I would, I would like to think that I'm able to get messages across in a way that hit people. Not always, because I don't. You don't all need to hit people right between the eyes when messages work. But I, I like to think if I have to get messages across, I can do it in a in a very effective way, both with words and with the way that I project my body to. So I think that would be it. But yeah, that's obviously what I would, that's what I would like. If someone was to ask someone else, I would like them to, I would like to think that that's what others would, would say. The answers in of themselves are quite revealing for yourself, David. I mean, it's something we spoke about with Johnny on the, pod, on the last podcast too. You know, we have to distinguish when it comes to football, be it players or coaches, are we playing a finite or an infinite game? And I think for those people that are scoped or they're welded to player development, they're certainly playing an infinite game. I think curiosity, traits like being open, transparent, you know, it's not just for football. It's a game of life, really. There should be no separation between who you are on and off the pitch. With that being said, I mean, for all the aspiring coaches wishing to go on a journey such as yourself, David, what advice would you have for them? Get mentors. Not people that are going to fluff you up, but, but people that will... Sometimes you might not like, but are the because they want to help you. So get, get in mentors. Being open and receptive to learning. I, I don't think that journey ever stops. I don't, don't think it ever, ever stops. I think the ability to evolve and adapt is unbelievably important. Um, I mentioned curiosity as well. Um, but if we go back to learning, there's, there's a, a guy called Alvin Toffler, and, and he had a quote that is, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those that cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. 
So you learn something. There's not one way to do things. What you've learned may in the next moment not be the right thing for what you need. So being able to learn and learn and relearn. And then it is about you on your journey. There's no question about it because if it wasn't about you, then I think you'd, you'd struggle really if if you're on that journey but that while you're on your journey that you influence people with integrity and you do the best you can until you know better then when you know better you do better and for those of which for those of which which i'm sure will be plenty after listening to this episode david that wish to indeed uh, follow you and your continuing journey where's best to locate yourself and your father online yeah twitter is probably twitter linkedin I, i'm not big on social media i don't really i don't really like social media it's great because i'll go on and i will learn and I've, I've met some fantastic people that's how we connected um but if you go on twitter i think it's dj mayor three and then we've got our podcast twitter as well where we put all of the not just the podcast, but stuff about the books, et cetera, on there too. And then um, LinkedIn. And I, I'm i I'm open to speaking to people. I, I love, I love speaking. I love listening. I love listening to, to people. I love hearing about the story and where they're at and again you never know what you might learn from them so yeah if people want to connect i'm more than happy to to chat and conversate with them fantastic i'll be sure to link all in the show notes below but david once again thanks very much for coming on hope you enjoyed it as much as we did yeah oh thank you very much connor appreciate you inviting me on and it was uh it was a pleasure